Come on in, welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about the best moves by First Boots. First Boots, there's just something special about them. It's a club filled with people who went home for playing too hard, not playing hard enough, being bad in the challenges, targeting the wrong person, being a thousand years old, dating David Murphy in the future, just being a weird little guy, forgetting your vape at home, or doing, quite literally, everything wrong. Their strategies are often genuinely incomprehensible, and yet sometimes they've actually… got game? Yes, not all first boots are laughable flops, just most of them. Today, I thought it would be fun to celebrate our favorite three-day players by taking a look at the first boots who actually showed some game sense and made a good play or two despite their early exit. Now, the bar is pretty low here. This is the Wendy Joe tier, but bear with me, and next week we'll take a look at the worst moves by First Boots. Now, that's gonna be a lot tougher to narrow down. So drop the brown trout and grab the neutral box and join me as we take a look at the best moves by First Boots in Survivor history. At number five is Zane aligning with everyone in Survivor Philippines. I'm serious here. In as much as you can call his general social game a move, Zane was the king of Matt Singh. He had alliances with everyone, everyone wanted to work with him, and he had more options than basically anyone on the tribe. Zane's just guilty of overthinking himself out of the game. Really, really hard. In Philippines, Zane immediately began forming secret alliances with everyone on his tribe. Now that sounds like a pretty bad strategy, but Zane was so charismatic and likable. People were catching on and they just didn't really care. Even after the first immunity challenge, where Zane, who just quit smoking cold turkey days before the season, is a large part of why Matt Singh fails, he's not really in the conversation as a target. No one wanted to vote him out until he told them to. This is where the Zane is good at the game part of this video ends. After the challenge, Zane asks his tribe to vote him out, banking on the fact that they all like him so much that they'll refuse? And that will give him more power in the tribe? Yeah, we might be seeing Zane on worst moves by first boots, too. It's a completely deranged Michael Scott-esque strategy. Even after Zane's declaration, a blindside against Russell starts brewing, but Zane stubbornly sticks to his vote me out strategy, even as both Malcolm and Angie beg him to reconsider. Ultimately, the rest of Matt Singh makes Zane's wish come true, and they vote him out unanimously. Much to his surprise, from King of the Tribe to King of Ponderosa. At number four is Marisa seeing through Russell in Survivor Samoa. Her best move and also her downfall, Marisa was the only member of Foa Foa to clock Russell for the threat he was so early. Russell's early game on Foa Foa was about aligning with everyone, then creating chaos so that all information flowed back to him giving him control. It worked really well in those first few days. Everyone on Foa Foa really liked him because they hadn't gotten to know him yet. Correction, everyone liked him except for one woman, Marisa, who saw through Russell's Russellness. She saw his double dealing, she saw his toxicity. She was probably even wondering where Jason's socks were. Marisa's early game perception alone makes her one of the most promising first boots ever, and on any other season, she's probably not the first boot. I'd bet on Marisa to make the merge 9 times out of 10. But like every first boot, Marisa had a downfall, and hers was taking her information about Russell and confronting him with it. A bad move against anyone, but especially Russell Hance, the guy who will move mountains to get you voted out should you so much as look at him cross-eyed. Russell had the tribe in his grip by day three, and so Marisa was sent home as the first of many victims of Russell Hance. On the bright side, Marisa, at least you don't have to hear Russell say Russell Seed on repeat for the next 36 days. And it's called a Russell Seed. At number three is Tina attempting to align with Ethan 
and Survivor All-Stars. Okay, maybe it's a cheat to include returning players here, but I don't have a lot of choices. What do you want me to do? Put Deb wanting to make a shelter out of rocks on this list? We got enough rocks here too, we could build a pretty decent shelter just using rocks. In All-Stars, there was a prevailing anti-winner sentiment from the 14 non-winners on the cast. No one has ever been more dead men walking in Survivor history than Hatch, Tina, Ethan, and Jenna heading into All-Stars. And Tina knew it. I don't really think there's any magic trick Tina could have pulled to save herself here. She was going home the second Saboga lost the immunity challenge. But she tried. Tina, unfortunately, was paired with perhaps the most anti-winner player on the entire season in Jenna Lewis, and Tina's old enemy from Australia, Jerry Manthe, was also here. So there are two players right out of the gate that Tina has no hope of ever working with. Tina's best and only hope was in trying to work with Ethan to get a winner's alliance going, believing that if her and Ethan could align, they could get Rupert. And if they could get Rupert, they could get Rudy, and the four of them could take out Jenna, and she could control the tribe. I like this move for Tina because she was thinking long term. It would have been easy for Tina and Ethan to try and throw each other under the bus and just try to live another day, but both of them agree to think long term and work together. And I think in a non-All-Stars context, there's probably a pretty good chance that Rupert does go with Tina and Ethan. Nevertheless, Tina's boot set the tone for the season that all bets were off and the big names were getting cut first. So, thanks Jenna! At number 2 is Diane kicking Clarence under the bus in Survivor Africa. For a first boot in Season 3, Diane showed a late-era Survivor sense of preservationism and self-interest bordering on mercenary, Diane was not the most popular player on Baron. She got them lost on the initial hike in, she was a bit of a weirdo, but she still might not have been the first boot from this tribe, but she just kept overexerting herself to the point of exhaustion. Also, drinking this disgusting, bacteria-infested, Big Tom-infested water probably didn't help. After immunity, she's extremely tired and dehydrated, and almost certainly going to be mercy killed by the tribe. Everyone leaves the camp except for Clarence, who stays behind to care for Diane, and he shows her a bit of kindness by privately sharing a can of beans with her when she asks him for some food. When the rest of the tribe returns, they're outraged that Clarence and Diane ate food without them. But Clarence justifies this by saying he was just trying to help a sick woman. In a scene that has aged... Uh, not so well. Diane watches as the tribe gets more and more heated against Clarence, as they accuse him of stealing their food. Then, she heaves him under the bus with whatever upper body strength she has left. I didn't ask for beans. Was it one of the big cans of beans? Oh I, I don't know about that. You didn't ask for, you didn't ask for I food? Didn't, I didn't ask. He said he was going to open up because he said I needed to eat. That's a lie, dude. I don't know. Diane's attempt to get the target onto Clarence instead of her is impressively cold-blooded, especially for such an early season. Diane, of course, still went out first here, but major points for trying. As for Clarence, well, much like my uncle at a family get-together, he never really recovered socially from the bean incident. The best move made by a first boot in Survivor history is Johnny Fairplay's swing vote positioning in Survivor Micronesia. For my money, Fairplay played the best game of any first boot ever. A guy who should have been the de facto target for his tribe from day one just on reputation, Fairplay actually maneuvered his way into a swing vote position on the favorites tribe, between the couple's alliance of Parvati, Amanda, James, and Ozzy, and Luke's dream alliance of Eliza, Amy, Penner, and Yao Man. It's genuinely perfect swing vote positioning. You could not ask for a better spot to be in heading into tribal council on day three, especially if you're the guy notorious for being sleazy, argumentative, and dishonest. Fairplay was at no risk of going home at all, and he is one of the safest people on the tribe, until he asks his tribe to vote him out. Most of you know this by now, but a few weeks before going out for Micronesia, former child actor and current large man Danny Bonaducci face-planted Fairplay at a reality TV awards show. 
possibly during the award for best faceplant. Heading into the season, Fairplay was still in massive pain from the injury, which was exacerbated by Yao Man bashing his face into the boat on day one. So instead of playing, he just decided to throw in the towel instead and asks his tribe to put him out of his misery. Now, I do think that had Fairplay stayed, he almost certainly aligns with Parvati and company, and someone like Eliza is the first boot instead of him. But up until he requested to go home, he was one of, if not the safest person on the tribe. He's definitely safer on Malakal Beach than anywhere Danny Bonaducci is. Got nothing else for ya. Next week, we're taking a look at the worst moves made by first boots. So make sure to come back and check that out. It's going to be super fun. Until next time, don't get idled out.